welcome. Two Notable Nobels, a podcast about the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine. My name is Harrison Doolin. I am a PhD candidate at the University of California, Riverside, and I will be your host for this web series. The purpose of this series is to trace key advancements made in the biological and medical sciences over the past 120 years or so, and we're using the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine as a guide. Now, every career has its highest prize, and the highest prize for a scientist is the Nobel Prize. It's the most prestigious award a scientist can receive, and it marks discoveries that have made a profound impact on our understanding of biology and our ability to treat diseases. Today, we will be examining the 1951 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, which was awarded to Max Thyler. The Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute chose to give Thyler the award, quote, for his discoveries concerning yellow fever and how to combat it, unquote. We'll be going over the discovery that yellow fever is spread by mosquitoes, the discovery that yellow fever was caused by a virus, and how Thyler was able to create a live attenuated vaccine for yellow fever that we still use today. But first, a little bit about Max Thyler. Thyler was born in Pretoria, South Africa in 1899 to Swiss parents. This makes him the first person born on the African continent to win a Nobel Prize. Quick aside here, there have only been three African-born recipients of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, all of whom were from South Africa and all of whom were of European descent. The reason for the lack of racial diversity among Nobel Prize winners is a topic for another time, but as the continent of Africa continues to modernize, we will hopefully see a person of African heritage receive the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in the not-too-distant future. Okay, aside over, back to Thyler. Thyler's father was a prominent veterinarian and microbiologist who was also the director of a veterinary research institute in Pretoria. Max Thyler would follow in his father's scientific footsteps, though he chose to be a medical doctor rather than a veterinary doctor. Thyler graduated from the University of Cape Town Medical School in 1918, after which he went to London to study at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where he earned a postgraduate degree in 1922. He was by this point devoted more to medical research than medical practice, and he began to study infectious diseases. Thyler then permanently emigrated to the United States, taking a position at Harvard University's School of Tropical Medicine. In 1930, he moved to New York to join the Rockefeller Institute, where he would establish his own lab and work for the next several decades. It was during his time at Rockefeller that he would develop his vaccine for yellow fever. So at this point, I want to talk specifically about yellow fever disease, which is caused by the yellow fever virus. This is kind of exciting because this is my first podcast episode devoted exclusively to a viral disease. We've talked a lot about malaria and bacteria on this podcast so far, but we've dealt with viral diseases mostly in passing. So let's get down to it now. What was known about yellow fever? Well, the disease had been known for a long time, centuries in fact. It seems to have first emerged in Africa with occasional outbreaks in Europe, then it was brought over to the Americas by Europeans in the 16th and 17th centuries. The disease was known to be deadly, though not in most cases. Most people who get yellow fever will develop a fever and a headache for a few days, and then recover. This milder form of the disease makes it clinically indistinguishable from other tropical diseases like dengue or Zika. However, about 20% of cases become more severe, with patients developing pains, chills, nausea, and vomiting. In the worst cases, organ damage can occur. Yellow fever is particularly characterized by hepatitis. What's hepatitis? Hepatitis is the medical word for inflammation of the liver. When the liver starts to fail in yellow fever, the patient's skin and eyes will take on a yellowish tinge, which is how the disease got its name, yellow fever. Organ failure can eventually lead to death, and the mortality rate of yellow fever is about 5-10% to in the absence of medical intervention. Over the centuries, outbreaks of the disease occurred in Europe, Africa, and the Americas, often killing thousands of people. In North America, these outbreaks were mostly limited to tropical locations, such as the Gulf Coast and the Caribbean, with some notable exceptions, however. In 1793, an outbreak of yellow fever hit Philadelphia, the then capital city of the newly formed United States. 
Over a period of only three months, the epidemic would kill 10% of the city's population, causing most of the country's federal government to flee the city until the epidemic had passed. Doctors in the city were helpless against the disease, having no idea how it was spread or what was causing it. Nearly 100 years after the outbreak in Philadelphia, almost no progress had been made in understanding yellow fever, and the virus was still killing in droves. One of the more notable outbreaks of the 19th century occurred in the Central American country of Panama. In 1882, a French company began work on the construction of a canal that would connect the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans through Panama. The project was destined to be enormously lucrative, not just for the French, but for anyone who wanted to ship goods without having to send ships around the tip of South America. However, in 1889, Work on the canal was suspended and the project was declared bankrupt. A huge contributing factor to the failure of the French effort to build the Panama Canal was the spread of tropical diseases, particularly yellow fever. While the French tried to stop the spread of disease among their workers, no one knew what caused yellow fever or how it was spread, so their efforts did very little. After seven years of work on the canal, nearly 20,000 workers had died of disease and work on the project was stopped. But less than a decade after the French project was terminated, a breakthrough occurred. In 1897, Ronald Ross discovered that malaria was spread from person to person by mosquitoes, a discovery that earned him the 1902 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. The implications of this finding were huge and got people thinking. Some began to wonder, if other tropical diseases might also be spread by mosquitoes. One person who thought so was Surgeon Major Walter Reed, a U.S. Army medical doctor and professor of bacteriology at the U.S. Army Medical School in Washington, D.C. Reed was appointed president of a yellow fever commission by the U.S. Surgeon General in 1900. The purpose of the commission was to examine the incidence of tropical diseases in Cuba and to, quote, give special attention to the questions related to the etiology and prevention of yellow fever." Unquote. Etiology is a fancy word for cause, so this was a mission to figure out what causes yellow fever. An outbreak of yellow fever in Cuba brought Reed and the commission to the island, where they began their work. They wanted to test the hypothesis that yellow fever was a disease spread by mosquitoes. To test this, they took the rather risky step of experimenting with human subjects. They hatched fresh mosquitoes in their lab, had those mosquitoes bite people sick with yellow fever, then waited a while for the yellow fever pathogen to propagate itself in the mosquito. They then took that mosquito and had it bite healthy volunteers with no known history of yellow fever. In the most striking of these experiments, out of seven healthy volunteers bitten with the contaminated mosquitoes, six developed yellow fever. While this is a rather small sample size, it was enough to convince the Yellow Fever Commission that mosquitoes spread yellow fever. However, this result was not obtained without cost. One of the doctors on the commission, in the course of administering the contaminated mosquitoes, was himself bitten by a mosquito and subsequently died of yellow fever. Additionally, a follow-up study of human infection with contaminated mosquitoes resulted in the deaths of three volunteers. While together, these results demonstrated that yellow fever was indeed spread by mosquitoes, this kind of human experimentation involving the deliberate infection of non-immune people would not be approved by any institution in the United States nowadays. Even if, as in Reed's study, the participants gave their full consent to being infected, the risks would be deemed far too great to proceed. Instead of human experimentation, most scientists would insist upon using an animal model of disease. However, at the time of Reed's study, there was no animal model for yellow fever. Injecting mice, rats, dogs, or pigs with blood of sick patients failed to produce yellow fever disease. Reed, when asked to justify his use of human subjects, stated, quote, as no animals could be given the disease and it was useless to follow the previously indefinite experiments, it was absolutely necessary to make these experiments on human subjects, or otherwise volumes could have been written and discussed, and yet we would have been no nearer the truth than at first. 
no progress could have been made toward the exact knowledge of the disease unless human subjects had been used, unquote. Now, it turns out there actually is an animal model for yellow fever disease. Yellow fever is a disease of primates, and monkeys can be used as an animal model of yellow fever. However, this wouldn't be discovered until 1928, so to be fair to read, there wasn't an animal model to work with at the time. And while the experiment was certainly risky, one might argue unnecessarily risky, it did prove the point. People now knew that yellow fever was spread by mosquitoes. Armed with this new knowledge, the United States stepped in where the French had left off building the Panama Canal. To control the spread of yellow fever, preventative measures were introduced including draining stagnant water and putting mosquito screens on windows. These preventative measures weren't perfect, but they greatly reduced the number of yellow fever cases in Panama. With their new power to stall the spread of the disease, the United States was able to finish the canal, a project that has had an incalculable impact on the world's economy. Awesome, right? This kind of story makes me wonder what the economic possibilities might be if we could continue to make strides against diseases. Now, after Reed's discovery that yellow fever was spread by mosquitoes, a question still remained. Namely, what exactly were the mosquitoes spreading? What was the microorganism that caused yellow fever? At the time of Reed's discovery in 1900, a big new trend in medical research was that bacteria and single-celled parasites, like malaria, could cause disease. Men like Robert Koch had championed the germ theory of disease, and Koch had laid out four postulates for proving a microorganism was the cause of disease. Koch's postulates required that the microorganism must be present in all cases of the disease, that the microorganism must be grown as a pure culture, and then that pure culture must be used to reproduce the disease in a susceptible organism. While these criteria were enormously useful in proving that a wide range of diseases were caused by bacteria and parasites, other diseases like yellow fever didn't seem to work the same way. Reed and his colleagues knew that the pathogen for yellow fever must be in the blood of sick patients because the mosquitoes were able to transmit the disease by drinking contaminated blood. But when they looked at the blood under a typical light microscope, they couldn't see any bacteria or parasites. So what was going on? Well, while most people were still on the hunt for bacteria and parasites that cause disease, a new category of microorganisms was beginning to emerge at the end of the 19th century. The research on this new category of pathogens started in plants. A group of scientists were working with a disease of tobacco, and they found that they could take a diseased tobacco leaf, grind it up, and pass it through something called a Chamberlain filter. Now, this filter had holes too small for bacteria to pass through, but you know what? The filtered material from the diseased tobacco leaf was able to make the tobacco plant sick. Hmm, interesting. There was something in the leaves that was too small to be a bacterium, but that nevertheless could be passed from one plant to another. These new microorganisms were given the name ultrafilterable agents, referring to their ability to pass through the Chamberlain filter. In 1897, a group of veterinary scientists showed that a disease of cattle called foot and mouth disease was also caused by an ultrafilterable agent. When Walter Reed heard about this, he suspected that yellow fever might also be caused by an ultrafilterable agent. He decided to perform another experiment on humans, where he would take blood from sick yellow fever patients, filter the blood, and then inject the filtered blood into healthy patients to see if they got yellow fever. Now, at this point, I have to read you what he writes about setting up this experiment, because remember, it's 1901 now, and four people have died from yellow fever in his human experiments. So, he writes this, quote, it so happened that on the day of Dr. Carroll's arrival in Havana, August 11, 1901, the first patient of the series of seven cases of yellow fever, which Dr. Guterres had produced by bites of infected mosquitoes, was taken sick. The fatal termination of three of these cases produced a somewhat panicky feeling toward yellow, experimental yellow fever among the non-immunes at Havana, which feeling was intensified by the sensational and distorted statements in one of the local Spanish papers. 
it was therefore extremely difficult, in fact practically impossible, to obtain for inoculation purposes persons who could with reasonable certainty be regarded as non-immunes. Unquote. I mean, no duh? Just the statement, human experiment kills three people, doesn't need to be distorted to produce panic. Again, this experiment was so ethically questionable, but anyways, Reed managed to find three people to inject with the filtered blood, and you know what? Two of them got yellow fever. Yellow fever was therefore shown to be caused by an ultra-filterable agent something smaller than a bacteria. Later, these ultra-filterable microorganisms were given the name viruses. That's right, yellow fever was the first human disease shown to be caused by a virus. Now, these discoveries were enough to make Reed a candidate for receiving a Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, he died in 1902 from appendicitis, only a year after showing yellow fever was caused by a virus, and the Nobel Prize cannot be awarded post-mortem. The torch was then passed to the next generation of scientists to continue yellow fever research, and that next generation included our Nobel laureate for today, Max Theiler. The holy grail of yellow fever virus research was a vaccine. Doubtless you've probably heard the word vaccine already, but let's go ahead and define it. A vaccine is a substance used to stimulate an immune response and provide immunity to a disease. Vaccines usually have four main properties. Number one, vaccines provide protection against disease. Obviously, this is the main property of a vaccine people want to see. Number two, vaccines are generated from the causative agent of the disease or one of its components. The causative agent, usually a microorganism, is attenuated or inactivated in some way to make it harmless, or else one of its components is isolated and purified. Number three, vaccines must not cause disease. Vaccines are rigorously tested to make sure they are safe before they are allowed to be licensed. If a vaccine causes more disease than the microorganism it is supposed to protect against, that's not a good vaccine. Number four, finally, vaccines elicit an immune response and establish immune memory. Immune memory persists after vaccination, usually for years, to protect you should you encounter the causative agent of the disease again. Now, vaccines had been around for a long time, centuries in fact, before Max Theiler began his research on yellow fever. The term vaccine originated with Edward Jenner and his 1797 work with smallpox. Jenner was a doctor working in Great Britain, and in the course of his duties, he observed that milkmaids who developed cowpox, a mild disease, were protected against smallpox, a highly deadly disease. Going off that observation, Jenner deliberately infected people, including an eight-year-old boy, with cowpox, and then deliberately infected them with the deadly smallpox to see if they were protected. Side note, this was also a highly unethical experiment by today's standards. If Jenner had been wrong about the protective effect of cowpox, the people he infected could have died. However, the people given cowpox didn't get sick when they were given smallpox, and Jenner's technique, called vaccination, came into widespread use. Jenner was fortunate to find a weak virus like cowpox that could provide protection against smallpox. The virus that causes cowpox is similar enough to smallpox so that the immune response generated to the cowpox virus can also attack the smallpox virus. But this similarity of cowpox and smallpox was a fact of nature, not something of Jenner's own doing. He worked with the variant virus he found in nature and found that it worked. But yellow fever didn't have a variant that was harmless enough to give to people. That is, it didn't until Max Siler made one. In 1930, Thyler was working on yellow fever at the Rockefeller Foundation in New York. By this point, it had been discovered that rhesus macaques, a kind of monkey, were susceptible to yellow fever and monkeys were being used to study and propagate yellow fever virus in labs. Thyler wanted to find a way to propagate the yellow fever virus in an animal that was easier to work with and not as expensive. Mice were the best option, but it had been known for decades that mice don't get yellow fever when injected by the usual routes, like injecting them under the skin. Thyler then tried a new approach. He directly injected the virus into the brains of the mice. He found that this invariably killed the mice, and he could isolate large amounts of virus from the mouse brains. 
This was good news for Thyler. If he wanted a new stock of virus to use for his experiments, he could grow the virus in a mouse. He found that as he passaged the virus through more and more mouse brains, the virus killed the mice faster and faster each time. The virus was becoming neurotropic. What does neurotropic mean? Well, for pathogens, a tissue tropism refers to the cells or tissues that can support the growth of that pathogen. Saying the virus became more neurotropic means the virus got better at replicating in nervous tissue like the brain. Here's the thing though. Thyler noticed that as the virus got better and better at replicating in mouse brains, it got worse at replicating in the monkeys. When he took the mouse adapted virus and used it to infect the macaques, the monkeys still got sick but didn't die anymore. So that was interesting. By becoming more neurotropic, the virus lost its lethality. However, it still made the monkeys sick, and by becoming neurotropic, it could produce severe neurological disease if it made it to the monkeys' brains. So not an ideal candidate for a vaccine, but it was a start, and Thyler wondered if by passaging the virus more, and with different types of tissue, he might end up with a virus different enough from the original that still provided immunity without making people sick. He looked around for another tissue he could use to grow the virus, and he found the yellow fever virus could grow in embryonated chicken eggs. He continued the passage of the virus in chicken eggs, each time checking to see if the virus had lost its neurotropism by injecting the virus into mouse brains. After passaging the virus 76 times in chicken eggs, that's a lot, the virus still killed the mice when injected into the brain. Thyler then adopted a new strategy where he cut out the nervous tissue from the chick embryos before injecting the virus. Now that the virus had no nervous tissue in the eggs to infect, it was forced to adapt to other chicken cells in order to grow. Eventually, in 1932, after another 100 passages of the virus in the nervous tissue-deprived chick embryos, Thyler and his team found that the virus no longer killed the mice, and it failed to make monkeys sick. This new attenuated strain of the virus was called 17D. A clinical trial to test 17D in humans was carried out in Brazil in 1937. It enrolled over 1.3 million people, and the result was that the 17D strain was found to produce no ill effects while still eliciting a robust immune response to the virus. 17D quickly came into global use in countries where yellow fever was common, and it was shown to be a safe and effective vaccine against yellow fever. In 1951, in recognition of the enormous benefit of the vaccine, the Nobel Committee at the Karolinska Institute awarded Thaler the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. The 17D yellow fever virus vaccine is still the most widespread yellow fever virus vaccine in use today, though mostly only in countries where the virus is endemic. It is not a required vaccine here in the United States, where we don't have yellow fever. But if you plan on traveling to West or Central African countries, you will be required to get the vaccine. Now, here's a question one might ask when looking at the current state of yellow fever. If we've had this safe and effective vaccine for over 80 years, why is yellow fever still around? Every year, about 30 to 60,000 people worldwide die of yellow fever. Why hasn't it gone away yet? Well, there are many answers to that question, including people not getting vaccinated for various reasons, but there is also the fact that yellow fever has an animal reservoir. Remember how we mentioned that yellow fever is a disease of primates? Well, that means that mosquitoes spread the virus not just among people, but also among monkeys and other primates. So let's say you go to a jungle region somewhere and vaccinate all the people against yellow fever and years go by and nobody gets yellow fever and that's great. That sounds good, but unfortunately you haven't eliminated yellow fever from that region. While you may have protected the humans from getting sick, the mosquitoes in the jungle are still out there, passing the virus from one monkey to another, and all it takes is for one of those mosquitoes to wander in from the jungle, bite a non-immune person, and boom, yellow fever pops up again. The animal reservoir of yellow fever makes the elimination of the virus an enormous challenge, because how are you going to vaccinate every monkey and eliminate every virus-infected mosquito? It's a logistical nightmare. 
So while the threat of yellow fever remains, it's very important people in endemic regions get vaccinated. Okay, that concludes this episode of Notable Nobels. This episode was recorded on November 1st, 2021. I want to thank Digital Mind Productions for providing the music. Next time on Notable Nobels, we will be continuing our focus on viruses, this time turning to a disease often called infantile paralysis that galvanized an entire generation of Americans to find a vaccine. Any idea what the virus was? Well, listen next time to find out. Thanks so much for listening. See you then.